Four planes spanning out over a continent of unknown territory larger than Texas, California, and Arizona combined. Over freezing wastes without people, without life, without vegetation. Nature's most formidable challenge to man. The four planes are gassed up. All controls triple-checked. Motors heated. For they face cold as extreme as 60 below. Unrelenting. Murderous. Photographic units lead the parade of science to the planes. Each is a flying laboratory. The cameras are the trimetrigons and the K-17s that spied out enemy secrets during the war. Now each plane carries 250 pounds of film to record some of nature's last great mysteries. The war's secret radar magnetic detectors are here, too, bolted on like bombs. In war, their electronic impulse is spotted minefields buried deep under the surface. Now they will read far below the ice, detect and identify minerals, coal, iron, precious ores. Bird gets the words, ready, sir. He boards the leading plane, gives the command, take off. Crews hasten to rock the ships and thus free the skis frozen to the ice. Now all the work that has gone before, the planning, the task of preparing ships, of training men, the perilous voyage through the ice, now all of these investments of time and sometimes of suffering are coming to focus. Takeoffs for non-stop flights over the desolate, danger-studded wastes of Antarctica. Flights of great distance, the equivalent of, back at home, winging non-stop from the Canadian border to the Gulf of Mexico. Aviation is all important in the Navy's Antarctic exploration. Just as aviation is all important in a modern Navy that must be strong under and above the sea as well as on it. Elf ice, Bird leads his four planes in the long climb over pressure ridge areas, heading for the polar plateau, 10,000 feet up. Below are no landing fields, only deep crevasses. Pressure ridge is 100 feet high. Instant destruction for a plane forced down. Bird pioneered the first South Pole flight in 1929. He applies again the practice of constant vigilance, careful calculations that assured his earlier successes. Over this cruel country, Bird flies today at three miles a minute. In earlier explorations, three miles in one day was frequently the utmost for Shackleton and Scott for Britain, Amundsen for Norway, and Bird himself for America. The Beardmore Glacier, 200 miles long, 50 wide, a thousand feet deep, who knows? Bird checks position by the sun compass. The glacier signals the South Pole itself. Here, Bird drops the flags of the United Nations, carefully boxed a symbol of America's goodwill to all nations. Now beyond the pole, Bird focuses his cameras and magnetic detectors on land new to him and to all mankind. Commander David E. Bunker wipes his frosted windshield, a constant source of trouble in polar flying. He is over the Shackleton Ice Shelf, named for the great English explorer who kept returning to the Antarctic until death so often escaped, kept its rendezvous with him. The smooth shelf roughens, dark rocks, called nunataks, appear above the ice. Then rugged mountain ranges as far as the eye can see. Bird's planes deep into the unknown are the eyes of civilization, recording, evaluating, mapping. Plateaus, mountain ranges with peaks 20,000 feet above sea level. The trimetrigon lenses clicking overlapping exposures every three seconds photograph from horizon to horizon. Coal, a mountain of coal. Bird later declares Antarctic mines, if once tapped, could supply the world's coal needs for centuries. These official motion pictures can give only a cross-section of the miles of photographic records accumulated on this expedition by the Navy. The exposed mapping film will take five years to assemble. Amplifying these are the radar magnetic detectors, accurately recording mineral discoveries of immense value for the future use of all mankind. England, Norway, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, South American countries, and Soviet Russia are claiming Antarctic territory. 
the United States recognizes no claim and so far has made no formal claims for itself. But international policies cannot concern the Admiral now. His duty is to keep his flying laboratories functioning, to fulfill his dream of a lifetime. The word gas half gone, sir, comes from the engineer tabulating fuel tank readings. Bird radios his pilots, return to base. By the third leg of their triangular course, the planes head back for Little America. Bird's plane takes the widest swing fuel permits as the lenses of the TriMets continue recording new territory. This is the last big flight. Bird is determined to record the maximum possible. One by one, the planes swing in over Tent City. Flight operations checks them in and safely down. Plane two, plane three, plane four. But not plane one. Bird's plane is yet to be accounted for. Bird is missing. appear above the ice. Then rugged mountain ranges as far as the eye can see. Bunger leans forward in amazement. His eyes have caught a sudden and unbelievable change in scenery. The universal white has turned to chocolate brown dotted with blue. A cameraman goes into action. 300 square miles of land without snow. Land that might be in New Mexico or Arizona. Pictures alone will prove Bunger has discovered a warm oasis in the shadow of the pole. It is for such supreme moments as this that men brave the hardships of exploration. The astounding, undreamed-of fact is that they are over a chain of warm water lakes whose shores, except for small patches, are free of ice and snow. Commander Bunger circles the largest lake in sight, five miles long. He comes in to make a landing. Water temperatures must be recorded. Sample was taken. He finds the water fresh, the temperature 38 degrees Fahrenheit. On the shores are vast deposits of coal and of minerals of the utmost importance to civilization. 